In this video, we are going to follow up directly from the previous video where we looked at proton chemical shifts to in this video look at carbon NMR chemical shifts. We are going to compare and contrast those with proton NMR chemical shifts, establishing the similarities and the differences between these two types of chemical shifts. First off, thinking about the similarities between a carbon NMR chemical shift and a proton NMR chemical shift, the origin of the chemical shift is the same between the carbon atom and the proton. So in the case of carbon 13 and proton NMR, the chemical shift in both cases arises from the difference in energy between the spin states. So when we look at a carbon NMR spectrum versus a proton NMR spectrum, and keeping in mind that the chemical shifts in both cases arise from the difference in energy between the spin states, what we see looking at a representative carbon NMR spectrum such as this one, we'll use this as just an example spectrum to highlight some things about carbon 13 NMR. This particular spectrum is a spectrum that was collected for a drug-like synthetic molecule to help in determining its chemical structure. The first thing that may stick out to you in looking at this carbon NMR spectrum relative to a proton NMR spectrum is the x-axis. In the case of proton NMR, typically the x-axis ranged from zero to about 10 or 12 ppms. On the other hand, here, our x-axis ranges from 0 ppms to about 200 ppms. And in some cases, with some functional groups, we can even go further downfield to larger ppm values than that. So what is the origin of this wider ppm range for carbon versus hydrogens? So when we look at the question of why is a carbon-13 NMR chemical shift range so much broader, about 0 to 200 ppms, than a proton NMR chemical shift range of about 0 to 10 ppm, what it comes down to is the extent of shielding or deshielding. Because just like with a proton NMR spectrum, when we look further to the left, closer to 200 here, we're referring to the carbons that are deshielded versus the further to the right we go, the closer to zero ppms, the more shielded the carbon atoms are. And remember that when we said deshielded, what we meant was hydrogen atoms, back when we look at proton NMR, that were nearby electron withdrawing groups that were feeling the full force of the magnetic field, whereas shielded protons were the ones that were shielded from the effects of the magnetic field by a blanket of electrons, by having a strong region of electron density nearby. Similar is true for carbons that deshielded refers to carbons in regions of low electron density that are fielding, feeling the full brunt of force of the magnetic field. So they are deshielded. We could also describe that as being downfield. Downfield meaning low magnetic field. They're requiring a low magnetic field because of the fact that they do not have an electron blanket around them protecting them from the magnetic field. Shielded, on the other hand, are going to be referred to as upfield. They require a higher magnetic field to change spin states because they are enshrouded by greater electron density, which is going to protect them from the magnetic field, making the magnetic field that the that the atom nucleus actually feels lower than what it is subjected to. And so they require uh, that they be upfield, that the magnetic field be stronger in order to elicit the change in spin states. So same phenomenon going here for carbon versus hydrogen. But in the case of carbon, carbon atoms are going to be more strongly shielded or deshielded than their proton counterparts because the carbon atom is one bond closer than a, its corresponding hydrogen to the strong shielding or deshielding group. Here's what I mean. 
So for example, an aldehyde group, the group shown here with the carbonyl directly bonded to a hydrogen is very downfield in both a proton and MR spectrum as we saw in the last video. And we will also see the aldehyde carbon is very downfield in a carbon NMR spectrum. Now, when we think about where the electron withdrawing group is located in this structure, the electron withdrawing group is our oxygen atom here. And bearing in mind that the presence of an electron withdrawing group is going to deshield the nearby atoms, that is the carbon and the hydrogen here, by pulling electron density away from the carbon and toward itself or away from the hydrogen and toward itself, what it does by pulling those electrons away is it is going to push the signal further to the left, further downfield by deshielding the carbon and the hydrogen. By deshielding them, pulling the electron density away, it's making the carbon and hydrogen feel the full force of the magnetic field. There is no shield there to protect the carbon or the hydrogen. Now, the carbon is especially deshielded because it is even closer to the electron withdrawing group than the corresponding hydrogen is. And so as a result, the carbon is going to be further downfield than is the hydrogen. And so as a result, the carbon in MR spectrum has a broader range than the proton in MR spectrum because of the fact that there is that capacity for the carbon to be in a much more electron poor environment, an environment where there are electron withdrawing groups much closer by in terms of the number of bonds separating the carbon atom from the electron withdrawing group than in the case of a typical hydrogen atom. So that's going to cause carbon chemical shifts to typically be 15 to 20 times larger than the comparable proton chemical shift. Meaning when we say comparable, we're referring to when they're part of the same functional group, such as in the case of the aldehyde here, the proton signal would be this one that I'm highlighting here, and the carbon would be that directly bonded carbon. And so the carbon essentially we could think of as being one atom closer to the shielding or deshielding group than its attached hydrogen. And that's what's going to make the signal range of a carbon NMR spectrum much wider, much broader spectrum than a proton NMR spectrum is that the carbon is feeling a much wider range of effects of electron withdrawing and electron donating groups because of the proximity, the closer proximity of the carbon to the electron withdrawing or the electron donating effect. So let's go ahead and write that down. So written out into words for us, the carbon chemical shift range we can say is wider than the proton chemical shift range because the carbon, as we saw in the case of this aldehyde example, is generally one atom closer to a shielding or deshielding group such as the oxygen than the hydrogen that's bonded to the carbon. The hydrogen has that carbon there sort of as a buffer separating it from the electron donating or electron withdrawing group. And so as a result, the carbon experiences a wider range of magnetic field strengths due to these electron withdrawing groups or electron donating groups. And hence, it is going to be spread out a much wider range over the chemical shift region, typically looking at zero to about 200 as the chemical shift range for carbon 13 versus approximately one to 10 ppms as a typical chemical shift range for a proton. Now, analogously to what we did when we were evaluating proton NMR spectra and their chemical shifts, we can look at an empirical table of expected carbon NMR chemical shifts in order to start to deduce features of an organic molecule. So these were empirically determined values, meaning that time and time again, scientists have evaluated carbon NMR spectra for molecules containing certain functional groups and found that the carbon atoms in those functional groups have chemical shifts that fall into a certain region. Just like interpreting the proton NMR chemical shift table, what we do here is we look at the particular carbon atom that is shown in red as our carbon that we expect to show up in a particular range. So I'm circling some of these red carbon atoms here that are parts of different functional groups. And then the blue band or the blue bar that shows up with it indicates the range of the spectrum where we would expect for that particular signal to show up. So the aldehyde, 
If we look at our blue bands here going with the aldehyde and follow that down to the x-axis, we expect an aldehyde group to show up somewhere between, say, like 180 or so, and then over and onward to something like 220. So very far, far downfield, just like with the aldehyde group that we saw in a proton in a Mars spectrum was also very downfield as well. So our same terminology applies that downfield is to the left, upfield is to the right. And we see as we follow across the spectrum, we see uh, decreasing electron density surrounding the particular carbon that we are focusing on in each of these experiments. And so we can use this as a tool when we are determining possible chemical structures for a molecule. We can start to piece together what functional groups are present based on where the chemical shift shows up within this spectrum. So this handout, this guide, is included in your packet of information that goes along with NMR so that you will have access to this when you are solving chemical structures. Keep in mind also analogously to the proton NMR information that we looked at, that if you have multiple electron withdrawing groups or multiple electron donating groups, those can act collaboratively to impact the chemical shift. So in other words, if we had a molecule that had both a alcohol group bonded to the carbon and the carbon was also part of say an ether group. Both of those are electron withdrawing. So in other words, what we're thinking about here is essentially a hemiacetyl group, a carbon that's directly bonded to an alcohol group. And that same carbon is directly bonded to, uh, alkyl to an oxygen bonded to an alkyl group. So the carbon of focus here, we would say is this one that we've put in red. We would expect the chemical shift to be further downfield than either the alcohol group or the ether group alone. And I can't tell you exactly how far, much further downfield to the left it would be, but it would certainly end up being not within the range of the ether or the alcohol, but instead somewhere a little bit further to the left here, somewhere, you know, more like in the 100 ppm region rather than this 50 to 75 or 80 region there. So keep in mind that if you have a molecule that's complex that has not just one functional group, but multiple functional groups, that you can get these chemical shift effects where the shift is moved further downfield by having multiple electron withdrawing groups. And the closer those electron withdrawing groups are to the carbon atom we're measuring, the further downfield that is going to be and the more prominent that effect is going to be of the electron withdrawing group. So carbon chemical shifts, in summary, they contrast with proton chemical shifts and they span a broader range here a broader region of our spectrum, typically being measured from zero to about 200 or 220 ppms. But similarly to proton chemical shifts, they give us information about the environment that a particular carbon atom is located in. That is what types of atoms are surrounding that carbon to either shield it with a high density of electrons or to de-shield it with a low density of electrons around that particular carbon because instead there's electron withdrawing groups nearby. So we can use that to infer what types of functional groups are present within a molecule.